second live stream offered by Hack for Impact Nationals. My name is Luke Kim. I'm a developer at Bits of Good, Georgia Tech chapter. And today I'll be talking about what async await is. Uh, let me share my screen first. So one of the reasons why we get confused when using async await keyword is that we try to learn how to use the keyword itself first without understanding how JavaScript handles asynchronous processes and all the things that went into before leading up to async await. And I'm talking about callbacks and promises. So uh, in this live stream, I'll be talking about specifically those things. I'll be first talk talking about how does asynchronous process work in JavaScript and how can we do asynchronous stuff with callbacks and then with promises and finally using async await keyword. Uh, hold on a second, please. So JavaScript by itself, by the by JavaScript by um, itself does not support asynchronous processes. And that's because you only allow one single flow of programming. If you look into the textbook definition of JavaScript, it says it is single threaded, which means that there um, could be only one flow of work. And um, yeah, so basically that. But how does, how, but how can we do asynchronous processes right now? How does our, uh, how does our app, how does our, how's the apps that we make handle asynchronous processes if the pure JavaScript don't allow just that? Well, um, if I, when I mean by pure JavaScript, I'm talking about the JavaScript engine, the code that turns your source code into machine readable execution, uh, executions. Those on uh, using JavaScript engine, it is not possible to implement asynchronous processes. However, when you're writing code, you're not just using the JavaScript engine, you're using the whole combination. If JavaScript engine is like a hamburger, the JavaScript runtime is represent, represent the whole combo. It, combina it combines JavaScript engine, web API, event loop, and callback queue. So you might be wondering what do those words mean? You probably see this in tutorials or on Wikipedia and never probably understood and had no um, sort of explanation of how they, be, how they are integrated. So let me show you what I mean uh, how, and how these four elements come together. So inside this little simulation, we're going to be representing the JavaScript runtime and how JavaScript is handling our source code over here. In our source code, you can see that we first console log JavaScript, then async, and then what? So it's kind of easy to assume what will the console log output, what will be the output of this program. We're gonna see JavaScript, async, and what in a row. So let's see how JavaScript handles that. So uh, let's read on that. First, JavaScript will read uh, the code by line by line and then execute it by placing them into a place called call stack. So call stack is the area where the function is gonna be reside for JavaScript to be executed and only um, one function at a time can be placed there or one line of function. If function, one function calls another function and then calls another function, then those three functions will be placed. But um, what I mean, but only one line of function will be placed on the call stack. So if you resume the simulation, we're going first, execute console log, uh, and then we're gonna execute async, pop that, uh, pop that code off, and then we're gonna execute what, and then pop that code off. Um, so it was supposed to be console logging over here, but if this was working, we would have JavaScript, async, and then what appear in a row. Let me reload it to see uh, if that does any trick. Nope, okay. Um, yeah, but that's what I mean by synchronous programming, how JavaScript handles things synchronously. 
um, and there's only one line of flow, one line of uh, flow uh, in the in the code. However, if we add a set timeout, if you wrap the second con uh, const log in set timeout. Uh, and give it about a second uh, time of two seconds. You can see that we'll first execute the, the first console log. And when we place, and we're going to be placing the, the, the set timeout function onto the call stack. But as you can see, inside our space called web APIs, we get a certain sort of function in there. So let me tell you what's going on over here. Like I said, JavaScript don't let you handle asynchronous processes. However, web APIs such as fetch, set timeout, or um, Ajax request allow you to do asynchronous processes. So that is why JavaScript is calling the, uh, telling the web APIs to handle this set timeout execution. And basically the set timeout will wait two seconds inside the web API and then push the function back into the callback queue as you will see over here. And meanwhile, JavaScript will continue going on without waiting for the set timeout to, uh, without waiting for this function to show up. So while it's waiting, it's going to push the next console log into this call stack. And then the function is going to be placed into the callback queue, which is going to be in the area where the, the function that we pass in into the set timeout is going to reside until, um, sorry, is, well, the callback queue is sort of where, we're going to, where the function that we're going to be passed into the set timeout will reside until the call stack is empty because we don't want to execute things while something is running. We want to wait until um, what whatever was on the call stack to be finished before we add into the call stack because we don't want to interrupt anything. So if I show the code one more time, the, uh, the function will be placed back in the callback into the callback queue. And then it's going to be pushed on the call stack and execute the final uh, console log. The simulation was really, is really funky for today some, for some reason, but uh, I hope you understand what I mean by JavaScript not being able to handle con uh, asynchronous processes and having to use the power of web API and callback queue to execute such functions. So let me go back to the presentation. So, there are many types of asynchronous fu uh, functions or asynchronous processes that we can do with JavaScript. And we define asynchronous functions as any function that we leave it to run outside of the main program work, main program flow. As you've seen, the set timeout ran in a different flow compared to the other console logs. We let the console logs that are, we let the functions that weren't asynchronous run first without waiting for the, uh, the set timeout to resolve. So examples of asynchronous functions could be set timeout, fetch, or super large disk write. Now we'll talk about how to implement these using, implement asynchronous processes using callbacks. So first we have to understand what callbacks are. Um, callbacks, in essence, they're just functions, but they are functions passed as an argument. And such functions, we pass functions as an argument because we want to place that function inside our uh, callback queue. And it makes sense because Makes sense because when we place the function inside the callback queue, we can pop push it directly into the call stack. And call stack, it can only execute a function. So that is the reason why we pass in a function and why callbacks exist. So let me give you a more detailed explanation of how callbacks work.
So over here, we have two functions on, called print and print with delay. Suppose you are always making the mistake of using print instead of console log. So you want to create a new function that does console log, but instead it takes print. Uh, well, that was not a good example, but here's what I mean. So callback, it seems like an argument, but inside our print statement, uh, it is executed as a function. So what we can do, we can declare, the, we can call the print statement, but inside we'll be passing in a function. That does console.log, um, hello. And if you run this, you can see that we get hello. So this is an example of using callback, but specifically it's a type of synchronous callback because we're not, um, um, we, we're not pushing anything to the event queue, uh, the, the um, callback queue, or using the web APIs to wait for something to happen. However, we can. There is also an asynchronous callback, which is just a callback that um, happens asynchronously. So for print with delay, suppose I want to pass in a. So first, we pass in an argument of a callback, which is just same as. First one. And but instead we for the second parameter we pass in the wait time of two seconds. And if we run this, we see that we get the second hello after two seconds. So that is just an explanation of what call, what callbacks are. They are um, functions passed in as an argument. So now I'll go over how to use them inside the uh, as, as an async, asynchronous process. So in our example, we're going to have a, an, a class called user storage, and it's going to be mimicking an API. Um, so user storage API will have two functions that we can use login user and get roles user. So login user will take an ID and password and match it if it matches to any credentials. And if it's successful, if those credentials suffice, we're going to be running the on success function. And if it doesn't, we're going to be running the on error function. And, and since this is gonna be mimicking an API, we're going to add a delay of two seconds because all API calls are technically happening as an asynchronous process. And same thing applies to get rules. We pass in a user, if that matches to Luke, and if it's on success, we'll um, output such a uh, JSON file, JSON object. And if it does not match to Luke, we're going to throw a new error called no access. So inside over here, we'll ask for the ID. So let's see that in action. Um, before that, uh, I'll have to explain how are we using this. So as you can see, we first call the login user and pass in the ID and password as the first two arguments because that's what it takes. However, for third and fourth argument, we're passing in a function which we defined it as a callback previously. And on success, we would like to call get roles. So which is why we pass in that function over here. And get roles itself is a function that takes an arguments, which is why we supply the user, user with role callback and error callback. And if we run this, it's gonna ask me for my ID, my password. It's gonna wait two seconds and then tell me that I have such role. Now you might be lost and I and you should be because this is really confusing. By just looking at this line, the, uh, this line of code, it's really not that intuitive what's going on. You're getting, you're passing a function. You're also passing another function, but inside that we're passing another function and then passing another function. 
So it is completely understandable and you should be, you should not be able to understand this code. And the problem is with callback is that you can conduct asynchronous processes as demonstrated, but so what, what if you want to get roles and then get their employee ID um, or get their salary information, get their team information and so on and so on. You would have to pass in the fun uh, callbacks um, inside, uh, you, you would have to be keep passing in callbacks into the on success method over here, which will lead us for us, which will lead us to have a code, a shape of a triangle over here, as you as you uh, see over here. So that is the downside of callback. It is difficult to read, and there is really no way for a difficult. Um, it's difficult to read, and it's also difficult to. Um, return a value and um, play around with it. However, we are, we can make this much more simpler by using promises. And promises are asynchronous programming done better. And what promises are, they are objects provided by JavaScript. Uh, this, uh, what promise is, is in, it's representing a value that could be resolved sometime in the future. So since, uh, so this might be kind of confusing. This definition might be confusing to many people. Uh, I'll, so I'll just try to break down what promises are in words real quick. So promises, like we've seen in the previous exa callback example, will take resolve and reject method. And then these, uh, these functions are executed whether when the promise is fulfilled or rejected. Um, so these functions will be executed whenever the condition suffice or not. And then what promise object offers you, it offers you a unique a cool method called dot then to access the result value when, uh, when the promise is resolved basically. So uh, another method that you can, it offers is to catch. So with this, now you can, um, do error handling, which was not something that you could have done easily by using simply callbacks. And it's going to be much more readable than when using callbacks. I'll show you a, an example of what I mean. Uh, so inside our API, we also uh, inside our, we also change our API slightly. Inside our API, we, instead of passing in two functions, I'll put them side by side to show more description of what I mean. Um, so inside our, so this is our implementation of the user storage using promises. And this is the implementation using the callback. So just to begin with, we already see that we don't pass in two arguments on success and on error anymore. However, instead of calling the, 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 the on success on error inside the function, we return a new promise that where we pass the on success and on error inside that promise. So, um, so that's how our API has changed. So instead of, so right, right now we're returning a promise. And then we, and then that, that um, we changed the get roles as well by returning a new promise instead of executing um, the function directly and resolving the, and passing in the on success on error directly. So it might, it, it's, it does seem really similar, but it changes when we try to implement uh, user storage and try to use it. And as you can see over here, we first call the user storage login user with the ID and password that we provide. And we can then use the dot then key uh, function to access the result value. So user storage login user promise to return on uh, this promise object. And when its result is going to print out, it's going to execute this function. 
which is provided with um, this uh, user function over here. So it's going to be calling the user storage get roles user. And then that result value, the result value of get roles will be executed um, um, will be executed and then the result value will be passed into the second dot then where we will call the alert hello user. And meanwhile, if there's any error happening, we will be able to catch them. The, all the errors will be cascading down to this catch statement where it will be console log. And as you can see over here, you can already see that the code is much more simpler to read. While over here, we can't, the code is really chunky and doesn't represent any logic, any logic. But I believe this line, the, this four line of code is much more readable even for beginners who don't really understand JavaScript as well. We're going to be calling the user, login user, then do something, and then do something, and then catch any errors. So it is much more easier to read and, a fa uh, and also faster to code them out compared to using callbacks. So callbacks, they, they, were, they are better than, no, promises they're better than callbacks, but they can still be better. As you can see, we're chaining dot then um, methods to every single one of them. And if we start chaining too many dot then, it will start, look, it will, it will start looking very weird. So what JavaScript offers is the async await keyword, the one that you guys have been waiting for this whole live stream. So async await is a syntactical sugar and a syntactical sugar to conduct asynchronous um, to do promises. So what does that mean? So promises is an object provided by JavaScript. It is something that you can also implement. You could probably create a class promise and implement all its features. And that will still be no different from promises that you're using right now. However, async await is the keyword provided, is the keyword, is the keyword like const var or any of those provided by JavaScript that helps you to do uh, promises more, much more easily. I'll show you what I mean. So this is the example of our callback help, but with async, uh, with, with async on wait. Our API is going to be looking the same because even with async and wait, you're still dealing with promises. So our API still will still return promises. However, when we're, in, when we're using that API, we will be call, using the await keyword. And what await keyword is, is going to be waiting for this value to be resolved. And then when, once that is resolved, we'll be pushing that into, we'll be assigned that to the verified ID. And since verified ID is waiting, we also put we also have to when we want to get something from when we want to do something with verified ID, as, as shown over here, we would also have to uh, await for it before being able to use it. And finally, we will be able to alert uh, what we wanted to show. Um, so what await is doing? It is basically placing a block in your code to literally wait for these um, values to be resolved. And um, however, one downside, so it is much more easy, easier to read what's going on. And uh, you're, you're, give, you're passing in the ID and password and then calling this function, get the result of it, and then calling this, this other function and getting the result of it. So it looks much like a synchronous programming uh, as compared to promises where you have to chain dot then dot then and catch. However, one downside of async and await would be that you would have to, if you, if you ever wanted to await for a, uh, of a result to come back, you would have to wrap the function, wrap the code that you wanted to await for inside an async function. Right now, it would be nice to have the verified ID await user storage login user outside of the async function and just console and just console.log the verified ID. 
However, this will return us a promise object that is not result because as shown previously, JavaScript will execute const verify ID and will not specifically wait for it to result and then execute console uh, this, this statement of code, which is, that's why, however, this is why we need to place the, anything that has to do with await inside an async function to signify um, that it's going to have to wait for a couple of times, that it is an asynchronous, that we, uh, it is an asynchronous function that's going to return a promise and have to wait until uh, it is resolved. So that is one downside of the asynchronous function. So that concludes the live stream of what async await uh, does. Any questions? And we do have a little activity prepared after this to practice if y'all wanna stick around for that. Um, I did see a question in here though, um, in the chat. Okay. Is there, it's about, is from Bob James. Is the await keyword like a dependency? We have to use the await keyword whenever we try to use something that is the result of await. Uh, we have to use the await keyword whenever we try to use something that is the result. Oh, yeah. So as you see over here, we call the user storage login user, and it's going to be the it's going to be we declare it as await because it's an it's going to be a promise that we don't know when it's going to be resolved. But if you want to use the verified ID again elsewhere in the code, we would also have to attach wait away to that function call because we don't have verified ID yet to execute it. So you could say it's like kind of like a dependency for the sub subsequent functions to use. Does that answer your question? Awesome. Any other question? Um, how on show of hands, how many of you are taking or uh, are, are watching this live stream because you don't have no understanding of a, uh, async asynchronous process in JavaScript, or you guys have been using um, these uh, asynchronous processes, but wanted to get like a more clear understanding of of what's going on. You can probably do that as like the first one or the second one in the chat, please. Okay. So what was the question? Like people who've already worked with like JavaScript, but they just don't really know new async yep. stuff. Is it that? Okay, someone or... new, complete, completely new to JS. Yeah. Awesome. So completely new to JS or um, wanted to get more in-depth understanding what async await was. So one often way that we use async await is we use the, we use it to fetch APIs. And I've been doing that. And then when I was like, learning JavaScript in, in the early days, I always messed up how to use uh, a, uh, fetch calls properly. So in oh, so many clutters. Uh, I hope this, you, can, you guys can see what, um, what my, I have on my code over here. So I'll just quickly go over how to call APIs in using async await. So as I mentioned, API calls are asynchronous by default because we would have to wait for it to come to us. So whenever we, so if we want to make the API request, we use this web API called fetch. And web APIs are the things that allow us to do asynchronous processes as I described previously. So the way how we use fetch, we pass in the API URL inside the, the as an argument, and it will make a call to the API, but we don't know when it will be resolved. It could take 10 seconds, two seconds, five milliseconds. Anyways, we would have to wait for it because it's happening asynchronously. And once we return to get the information about a Gibble, which is a Pokemon, we get the JSON object. We, took, we first convert it into JSON object because um, that's what the API specified. And then if you want to access attributes of specific uh, attributes of that JSON object, we would have to, we can 
append await and use the previous results and access the attributes as such. And same over here, if you want to get the specific picture of Gibble, we would have to add we have to add await to it because we uh, we don't have this result available yet. So API calls will be a chain of await and await, which and at finally we will have to we will be returning the the actual uh, the result. Um, to show this demonstration, it's really cute. Uh, You can see that it returns um, this little Pokemon guy. And so that's just, I wanted to explain about how to use APIs specific, specifically. Um, any questions on how to use APIs or any other questions? Uh, okay. Uh, is that then mainly used for exception handling. Oh no, dot then is not used for exception handling. Dot then is to get the value of the result promise. So over here, I think this was, right? Yeah. I think you may oh. have meant, um, because you mentioned dot catch is something to like catch anything that happens in the chain. What's a dot catch equivalent for a single weight? Oh, is that is that what it's asking? That would be my uh, assumption. I don't know. Do you, do you, can you think of anything that's like a, I think we would have to wrap everything and try catch for, for async await. If you're having, if yeah. you want to implement this in async. So yeah, you would have to, you have to do that. Oh, huh. okay. In line 34, 35, I saw dot then with dot catch. Are, are you talking about over here that we are using dot then and then we use dot catch and you're confused what dot catch is doing. Oh, the difference. So honestly, there is no inherent difference. Oh, well, if there is a difference dot, then it's going to be getting the result value of the previous promise. So while dot catch is going to be catching any errors that are passed down from those promises. Um, so, so we call the user storage, which returns a promise. And then that resolved value of that promise will be passed in as an argument as a user. And this, this function, get roles, will be executed, which then will return a promise. And which allows us to access the resolved value of the promise using user and then running this function. But suppose that we get an error over here, we get an error in login user, then this error will be trickled down from this then to this then all the way to catch and will be constant login. So, so you want to be um, trickling down the result value of the promises more than to, uh, more than a line of code. So if you get a, if you get a promise from this line, that result value won't be able to be accessed in this dot then. Well, unless you pass it in from here. However, suppose if we throw, get an error in this line of code, that that error will be passed all the way down to this catch statement. Does that make sense? Sounds like he got his answer. Okay. Ooh. Yeah, it all has to do with like the resolve and reject functions on lines 22 and 24. Like if you ever call reject, it'll go to the dot catch. Yeah. Awesome. So I guess we can get started with the the, the simple exercise that you had then. Yeah, for sure. Um, I could present, but I, I think I just slacked you the, uh, the code pen if you want to just like pull that up. Okay. On your current stream. Oh shoot, we're gonna enter private messaging. Oh mm -hmm. no. <laughs> we're showing your Slack history, of course. Uh, but yeah, um, hold on. Hold on. Under.
Can you see my screen, Ben? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, still living with my parents, so you know. <laughs> have to put it from time to time. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for just pulling up the JavaScript part. We don't have to care about the issue on CSS here. Um, but this is a fork of a very, um, very iconic project in the Georgia Tech Bootcamp in particular, um, where we had everyone make their own dad joke generators that would go call an API of terrible dad jokes and then return stuff back to uh, back to a little front end on CodePen. Um, so we have a very simple setup here um, where you have some buttons on the left that'll make a call to the dad joke API and then it'll spit out a dad joke on the right. So if you click on like the make me laugh button, uh, you can see, yeah, if you click on it a few times, it'll just generate a random joke. And then you can also generate by category. That's not super important for this activity, but it's a fun little feature as well if you wanna explore that API a bit more. Um, but yeah, pretty straightforward what it's doing. Um, take in a category, spit out a joke. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can see some JavaScript for all of this stuff. Um, and I've highlighted two activities here. We'll send out a link to this so y'all can like fork it and actually work through these on your own computer. Um, but yeah, uh, the basic setup that we have um, inside of this first function, if you scroll up a little bit, yeah, cool. Um, or actually down, like line 12 is what I was trying to see. Uh, scroll up, cool. Um, so yeah, this is our get dad joke function that, get, that runs everything for us. Um, what it does is it takes in a topic, which could be hipster or history or bees, as you can see. Um, and then it throws that into a URL that we go to request a dad joke from somewhere. You don't have to worry too much about that options object. It's just necessary to get everything working. Um, the real meat of everything starts on line 28 below that big block of comments where we call the, whoa, dude, go back up. <laughs> That's not 28. Uh, here, yes. Um, so yeah, on line 28, we call the fetch function, which Luke just demoed for like fetching all that Pokemon stuff. We're doing the same thing to fetch some dad jokes, pass in the URL. And then right now we're using a chain of dot then functions first to take in the response that we get from the API and convert it to JSON. And then another dot then because converting an API response to JSON is an asynchronous process. It actually does stuff on your disk. So it might take a um, non-variable amount of time to return something. So that's another dot then. And then once we've converted it to an object we can like use, um, we go ahead and parse that result and then throw it onto our screen. You don't have to worry too much about that logic, but that's what's going on there. Um, so in this first activity, um, just basically asking, try to write these chain of dot thens using a sync await syntax. So just try to refactor it um, and then use the words await instead of the chain of dot thens. And you don't have to worry about error handling um, but if you want to try that, um, it will be a cool little activity to do as well to see how dot catch works. Um, so I'm going to grab the link to this and y'all can go check on general. Um, I'll put it in a thread inside of our zoom link. Um, yep. So if everyone goes to the general channel on Slack and looks at the uh, little thread of comments at the very end. Um, you should be able to get that code pen and fork it yourself. Um, yep, I put it inside of a thread. I kind of regret it. Hang on. Let me, let me make it extra public. There we go. So yeah, go check that out. Um, ah, yeah, no big deal. Um, and I guess we can give you all a few minutes to go over to that code pen and try to type this out yourself. Um, if you have questions, just unmute and ask them.
Also, sorry guys, but comment out line seven. I meant for that to be commented out until the second activity. It's not the end of the world, it'll still work. Um, but yeah, comment it out if you're getting any like weird behavior while you're working. Raise your hand in the chat if you're feeling good. Do we only have one hand? I guess I could say raise your hand if you're, oh, okay. Okay, we got, we got a couple. I guess I could say raise your hand if you're working on it right now. <laughs> like you're actively still working on it. What? Okay, okay. We have some people following along and some people making dinner while they watch. I respect that. We understand that. We'll still go through a solution though. Um, so it looks like you've got something cooking over here. Um, I do have a solution, but if this works, we can use this.
No, it's okay, Ben. Let's go with what you had. Okay. Yeah, I, I get what you're doing, making like a sort of another function to make it more readable. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I just I just went ham and added the async keyword to the top of this entire function here. Um, so if you go, or yeah, it would be at the very top. Yeah, you already did that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you scroll down, I think this will work if you just delete the uh, set text function or run it. Well, you, well, you need everything inside of it. Um, oh. Yeah, you can just run set text and it should work. Yeah. And then just remove it, yeah. My only thought is, uh, it doesn't actually have to be async, uh, the set text function. Since now that we've already done our async stuff, we're, we're good to go. Um, is it working? No. It was about a joke about a dog and now it's about a cemetery. All right, dope. Yeah, pretty simple little refactor. Um, you just kind of take the dot thens, and instead of saying, all right, fetch a thing, then do a function, you can just say, all right, wait for this and put it in a variable. I don't even need the callback function anymore to like handle the response. I can just wait for it to come back and then assign it to a variable, keep going with my flow. Um, so, oh, there's a couple of things in the chat. Um, yeah, what, what is this? Can someone explain this fun? Ah, well. Oh, okay. I mean that. <laughs> uh, you don't have to worry too much. So, so do you mean um, the get dad joke function in general or the fetch URL part of it? What is topic? Um, you don't have to worry about it too much. Except, yeah, if you scroll to the top to see where it's used, um, it's in it's in there. Um, so what it does is it actually grabs the topic to use off of the button that you used to click on it. So if you actually pull open the HTML there, this part is totally like unrelated to async await stuff. But if you're curious, um, every button, if you see there on like line eight and line nine, um, they each have this thing called data dash topic, which is basically a cool way of putting variables or other information inside of your HTML. And then you can pull that out of the HTML to use inside of your JavaScript code. So like on the hipster button, I added a little data topic of hipster. So then whenever um, I click on that button, JavaScript can say, okay, the button that clicked on this has the topic of hipster on it. So I'm gonna grab that topic and I'm gonna convert it to a variable that I, that I can actually use in my code. So if you look at the JavaScript again, you can kind of see what it's doing is, um, and if you're not super familiar with like add event listener, that's fair. Um, but yeah, Luke, if you pull up in the JavaScript part. JavaScript. Yeah, inside, inside of here, it uh, listens for whenever you click on something on the screen. And then, and then it figures out the data topic part um, based on the thing that clicked. So if the thing that clicked has data topic hipster, it uses that in the function. Um, and it's having, yeah. Yeah, it, it does get sent to the API to basically say, hey, API, please give us back an object that we can understand. And if you're unaware, JavaScript, or sorry, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. So it's literally like saying, give me back a blob of stuff that I can actually use inside JavaScript, please. Um, and that's why it's called accept, which is I, I will only accept something that I can understand. Um, please, please respect that. So does that make sense? Cool, yeah. JSON is actually used by languages that aren't JavaScript. It just happens to be called JSON because that's it originated on web technology. So that's kind of why.
I mean, anyways, we have a little time left in the night. Um, if you want to scroll down to activity two, I can explain it a little bit. Uh, yeah, this one, I, I added a lot of explanation just to be sure I was clear about what's going on. But this is like the classic, as Luke mentioned, the triangle of death, um, where you just have this big triangle of functions that call other functions, and then it just gets deeper and deeper as you go. In this case, we want to basically run the same function like four different times with five, with like half a second of delay between each one. So like call get dad joke, wait half a second. Call get dad joke again, wait another five seconds. And with the way set timeout works, where it accepts a callback function that will execute half a second later, um, you have to do this weird syntax to continuously call it only when it's been an, a half a second. So the goal here, um, if y'all are able to figure it out, uh, is uh, if you scroll up just a tiny bit. Uh, yeah, the challenge is instead of using set timeout, try to implement a really simple like, it, this function should only be like a few lines long, but implement a function called sleep that will take in the amount of time you want to sleep for um, in milliseconds, the same way set timeout does it. Um, and then waits a little bit and then resolves, as we mentioned before, with like the promise object and calling resolve to say, I'm done. I promise to return something to you. Uh, use that pattern. And then in your code, you could do something like this, where you say, get dad joke, await half a second, and then call get dad joke again, await another half second, and then keep going. Um, that's the goal. Create a function called sleep that you can kind of throw into your code and rewrite this set timeout. Um, jargon that we have going on right now. Um, you could totally Google this and find a Stack Overflow answer in two seconds. Try not to. Um, I linked the guide that Bits of Good uses for this that Luke's presentation was also based on. Um, that has a nice little recap of what the promise object is. So you have some copy pasteable code since you may have forgotten or are just not comfortable with it yet. Um, but yeah, try to work through that and we'll see if anyone has a solution.
Yeah, Luke, it's really weird that that isn't working. Uh, you should definitely uncomment that line. But uh, was it was it not actually doing the uh, rapid fire jokes? <laughs> yeah. Well, it wasn't. Okay. Yeah, leave it uncommented for sure. And scroll down. Did you uh, change anything? It looked the same. I mean, that joke is now async. That's one thing. Um, that shouldn't matter. At least I don't think it should. It that shouldn't matter. Oh wait, is it actually doing the five, the half second thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can't confirm that won't work though. <laughs> There's some trickiness here. It's also an error now, which is weird. According to CodePen, something doesn't look right, and I, I still don't know what it is. Oh. Why is all of that? Oh, oh yeah. Well. <laughs> you do be like that. You will always forget the async word, by the way, people. Okay, hands in the chat. Who's still figuring this out? Hmm. <laughs> hands in the chat. Who is going to do this activity tomorrow? And not right now. Dang, people really did step away. You hate to see it. I really do be like that though. Or maybe they just don't know how to raise hands. So that could also be a thing. <laughs> Type words in the chat if you don't know how to raise your hand. I don't even know where my button for that would be. Oh, it's reactions. Um, if anyone's trying to find that. Well, that's good. We like to see that. And this will be recorded. So tell your friends. Um, but yeah, this is like most of the way there. Um, but, oh, all right, all right. Uh, so yeah, a anyone still working on this or should we just jump into a solution? Just type solution, please, in the chat. Okay, chill. From our great attentive boy. All right, all right, let's, let's see this, let's see this. Um, so, Luke, do you want me to point out something? Yeah. You're, you're going to feel like a knucklehead for forgetting. Um, we, the sleep function should return a promise, which currently it does not. It simply right. calls set timeout, but doesn't actually do anything. So set timeout is what you need. Um, but yes, you will need to make a promise. This. Yeah, exactly what you said. Do I have to do it like this or can I just specify? Um, actually, yeah, what do you had here? And then the function that gets passed into, into set timeout, instead of being a lambda that does nothing, which right now it's just like make a function does nothing, um, it should actually resolve inside of that function. So you could just pass res to this thing directly. Yeah. And what uh, this does is it literally says after the time that was passed into this function, which is time 500, um, it will resolve the promise, which is the thing that we're returning. This is pretty abstract where you're actually creating a promise 
that promise has the resolve callback on it. And then we pass that resolve callback to our set timeout function. This is kind of the way you retrofit um, functions that take in callbacks but don't return promises. You can literally just wrap those functions in a promise and then resolve that as the uh, callback to the thing. Sorry, yeah, it's a bad, yeah, that's a weird word, right? Um, <laughs> I guess what I mean by that is like, if you ever have a function that's like, I really wish I could just await this thing, um, you can just wrap that function in a promise and then the callback that it takes in can just be resolve. Um, so it, it's like on the web, you don't have a, a set timeout that you can await, which is the thing that we're implementing here. So we had to wrap the whole thing. By retrofit, I meant like taking a function that doesn't work with a sync await and forcing it to work with the sync await. Um, but yeah, if you run this, it should work in a perfect world. Look at that, it's beautiful. Um, so yeah, that, that was a really contrived example of uh, <laughs> how you can use promises in your code. Um, this takes a lot of just trial and error and getting used to. Um, as you saw, we both forgot that we had to write async outside of our function for all of our await stuff to work. You will forget this for the rest of your life. Um, and then creating promises is like a little weird. It's not super intuitive. And you have to use the word new, which is like not something you use in JavaScript very often, um, but you get used to it. Um, as you get, especially with like backend code, you have to do this stuff like all the time. So it just drills into your memory. Um, oh, sorry, there's a function in here. A function, there's a question in here. Uh, if you wanna take that or what? Uh, so it's async like in the function and wait in the call. Yeah, basically async, if you declare a function as async, it is basically telling it will return a promise. Just like how you code in Java or, uh, or any those kind of language that they teach in school, you have to like specify what type the thing is returning, or what what is what the function is returning, and it's kind of similar to that. It's specifying that the function will return a promise object, and await is telling that to wait for that promise object to resolve. Does that make sense? So, actually, uh, that's not totally correct. Um, oh. I just tested this myself to be sure. Um, but you're totally right, except for you don't actually need to use the word async on this sleep function that you just created. The async decorator just says that this function can use the word await inside of it. But you don't have to use async if you're returning a promise. Um, a promise is its own entity, its own thing, and it actually works. So async is basically saying inside of this bucket, I'm going to use the word await. So you better be ready for me to do that. Um, but if you don't use the word await inside of your function, you don't need the word async either. It's like, if you use one, you need the other. That's like, that's the only thing. Yeah. So if you get an error and it says await doesn't exist, put async on the function. That's like the way to debug it every time. Yeah, sorry. It's not very intuitive because you would think you have to write async if you're returning something later. But yeah, sorry to interject. It's just weird. Okay, are there any other questions, thoughts? Positive words, feedback? Negative words, feedbacks. Ne oh. Not negative. That's allowed. That's allowed. Yes, we uh, actually have yeah. two weeks about React hooks. Or, yeah. Awesome. We should pull up. Yeah. Um, not gonna lie, uh, this one's hosted by UIUC, and I may have slid some Georgia Tech bootcamp materials under the desk. See if they use them. They may have something better. So it might be even better than anything the Georgia Tech bootcamp's gonna throw at you. 
but yeah, that'll be exciting. Um, it's hosted by Cornell. It's hosted by UIUC, um, which is University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Oh, it just says uh, we're hosted by Cornell. We don't have Zoom Premium. Oh, that right. <laughs> yeah, I never explained that. Yeah, like every college is Zoom, and Georgia Tech is blue jeans, and we didn't want to subject people to blue jeans, so spotted the link from Cornell. Yep. All right, we'll pull up for that. Everyone who's out there listening. Uh, have a good night. We will post this recording to YouTube and the link is in the chat. If anyone wants to fork that activity and work on it after this workshop um, or if anyone's following along later. Uh, yeah. Luke, any last words? Uh, thank you so much, guys. This is my first live stream um, explaining something to general audience. It was an amazing experience and thank you for keeping up. You guys are awesome. And I mean, you crushed it. Uh, thanks. All right, guys, get some sleep and I'll hopefully I'll see you guys next time.